The men's track and field team makes history. And the baseball team opens up their season. This is All Access, and it all starts right now. Welcome to All Access, the show that has a little bit of a different look, but still has the same premise, which is bringing you the latest in Rowan sports. I'm Cody Decker. And I'm Derek Hill. The Nor'easter put a damper on the action this week, but there was still plenty of it. So let's get started with the latest on the track and field teams. Cody. Thanks, Derek. The Prost men's track and field team competed in the All-Atlantic Track and Field Conference Championships this past weekend up in Ithaca, New York. Through the first day of the competition, the Prost found themselves in fourth place with 27 points through six events. Bobby Cook set a meet record with a time of 8.01 seconds in the 60-meter hurdles in the preliminaries. The 4x400-meter relay team of Chris Messiano, Justin Bishop, Hunter Barbieri, and Francis Terry won with a record time of 3 minutes, 18.4 seconds, to round out the first day of success for Rowan. The women's track and field team were also on hand in Ithaca for the All-Atlantic Track and Field Conference Championships. In the first day of their competition, the women also found themselves sitting in fourth place with 27 points after seven events. The big standout for the pros was Kim Johnson, who won the pentathlon with 2,977 points. She placed in the top six in all five events. Aspen McMillan also won her event as she recorded a meet record time of 8.84 seconds in the 60-meter hurdles preliminaries. The women's lacrosse team started their season with a thrilling 11-10 win on the road against their Sinus College. With a score tied at 10, attack Maddie Bray nailed the game-winning goal, which was one of her six goals on the afternoon. Midfielder Liz Kramer had a goal and an assist. Other goal scorers included Kim Doyle, Alex DeGarris, Ashley Leichleiter, and Nicole Mickendra. Rowan goalie Aaron Horner recorded four saves. The Prost would head home for their home opener against the Stevens Institute of Technology. A lot of news in sports, but also entertainment this week. Let's send it over to Chris Devine with this week's Pro Talk. Hello everyone, I'm Chris Devine. Welcome to this week's edition of Pro Talk. We have a lot to get into this week in the world of pro sports, so let's see what we have. NBA legend Kobe Bryant has been regarded as one of the greatest players of all time, but on Sunday night, Kobe joined some elite company by himself. Bryant won an Oscar for Best Animated Short Film with his movie Dear Basketball. The film was based on a poem that he had written in 2015 when he was considering retiring from the game. He had assistance in making the movie by Disney animator Glenn Keane. Bryant said in his speech, quote, As basketball players, we are supposed to just shut up and dribble. A little clap back to Fox News. But I'm glad we are able to do more than that. On quote. Kobe has always been compared to the GOAT himself, Michael Jordan, but I'm pretty sure Michael has never won an Oscar. Italian officials have opened up an investigation into the death of David Astori. Astori, the captain of Fiorentina in the Italian Soccer League, was found dead in his hotel room just hours before the team's game against Udinese and just 24 hours before Story was set to sign a new contract that would have kept him at Fiorentina for the rest of his career. The Italian league president has asked for fans to refrain from being insensitive about the incident as an autopsy, which was scheduled for Tuesday, should reveal the cause of death, which is currently being assumed as sudden cardiac arrest. A Story's funeral is set for Thursday in Florence, Italy. He was just 31 years old. And finally, to some NFL Combine news, UCF linebacker Shaquem Griffin has been turning heads at the Combine for a few reasons. Griffin, who was born with a condition where his left hand did not fully develop, was not originally invited to attend, but has been turning in some incredible performances, first bench pressing 225 pounds 20 times with a prosthetic hand, and then clocking in a 4.38 second 40-yard dash. Griffin's brother Sha uh, Shaquille, Shaquille, excuse me, is a cornerback for the Seattle Seahawks. Griffin is sure to be the talk of the football world leading up to the draft. It'll be interesting to see if a team with a need at linebacker will be willing to take a chance on a player with Griffin's condition. While 40-yard dash times and bench presses don't tell the full story about a player, Griffin's story is definitely an inspiring one. That's all I have for you on this week's Pro Talk. Coming up after the break, Cody and Derek have the latest on the diving teams. But after the break, Mo hosts this week's Pro Sports Roundtable, so stay tuned for more All Access.
Welcome back to All Access. Time for our Roman Roundtable. Joining me today are Cody and Tom to discuss, discuss topics in pro sports. You guys ready? I was born ready. Interesting. I was. I'm yeah. not kidding. Cody's. That's not a cliche. Cody's an interesting guy, isn't he? Yeah, yeah very, very interesting. So, you know, guys, it's been a lot of talk about the Giants when it comes to this NFL draft coming up. You know, so my first question for you guys is, do you think the Giants should draft arguably the best running back to ever come into the draft in the past 25 years in Saquon Barkley? Or should they draft a quarterback in hopes for the quarterback to learn under Eli Manning and eventually take over the reins? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if Saquon falls to two, it's going to be a very gift, a big gift for the Giants because they really need a running back. They haven't had a consistent running back since maybe Brandon Jacobs when they won the Super Bowl. So I really think that Saquon Barkley is the best player in the draft. I know a lot of teams have that sort of mentality where they want to pick the best player. Um, but at the same time, Eli is at a tough age right now. He's only getting older, so if you draft the quarterback, you can't go wrong there. I could see them going either way, but if Saquon's on the board, I think you got to take him. As the expert on the New York football Giants, I will tell you, Cody, first of all, in the second Super Bowl run the Giants had, Brandon Jacobs was terrible. Ahmad Bradshaw was the good running back, so let's just get that out of the way. As a child, also, right? um, so it all depends on the day, if you ask me who they want to take. You know, one day I want to take the lineman from Notre Dame, one day I want to take Rosen. There's actually a large part of me that almost hopes the Browns take Barkley at one so the Giants can get Rosen at two. It's tough. Uh, the only thing is, it's the question I just want answered is what do they think of Davis Webb? They drafted him in the third round last year. If they actually think and they have evidence that he can be good, then don't draft the quarterback. I mean, they've said countless times, you know, he's like a younger Eli. So if that's the case, draft the lineman. Or, I mean, I wouldn't mind taking Barkley. The thing is, they got Gallman in the third round from Clemson last year. Darkwood getting a lot of carries was good. But like you said, a generational talent like Barkley, it's kind of hard to pass up. I think they should trade back, go to a pick like, I think they should trade with the Jets, get pick six, draft the lineman, snag the Jets pick next year because you know the Jets are going to have another high pick. I know it's almost kind of like you're deferring from making a tough option, Ooh. but the Giants have a lot of areas they need to work with. I think running back's one of those things that, you want to fix last. You need to fix your linemen. You need to fix your linebackers. You need to fix your secondary. I mean, that being said, I would not be upset if they got Barkley because of the talent he is. Uh, but hold on. Number, in, in, number one, the Jets are better than are going to be better than the Giants next year. That's a whole other bet. That's a whole other debate. You wanna, so you you're going to have a better it? pick than we are. Okay, you're going to have a higher you pick. Shake on that kid? Number two, what do you mean it matters on what day it is? They're going to be picking on the same day at the same time at pick number two. I'm just two. saying, like yesterday, I was like, oh, I want him to get Rose, and now today, I'm thinking, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, maybe Barkley might be the better pick. You so know? you're unsure. Yeah. You know, back to back to what you said, as a Thank fellow you. Giants fan, Thank you know. I personally don't want them to pick an offensive I feel this lineman. Topic's biased. <laughs> I don't want them to pick an offensive lineman. The last time the Giants picked up an offensive it lineman, was Eric Flowers. They yeah. drafted Eric Flowers yeah. over Melvin Gordon. You know, Eric Flowers, who was a right tackle in college, and they put him at left tackle, and now we've all seen how that's turned out. Yeah, it's almost like two is a weird pick because you don't want to take a lineman because you want to do that if you had like the six to ten or something like that. I wouldn't mind. I mean, I wouldn't mind a quarterback because I think Rosen's going to be great. I think he'd fit in in the Giants system, even though it's a new one. Uh, but Barkley's hard to pass off on. So, keeping this in mind, what do you think is going through Cleveland's head right now? <sighs> I think they're, they, uh, they definitely visited draftjoshallen.com because uh, that, that shows Josh Allen is 6'5". It shows that he looks good in shorts <laughs> and that he has a rocket arm. Josh Allen is your prototypical, I can do well at the combine and I'm tall, so I'm going to get drafted way ahead of where I'm supposed to. Josh Allen's not going to be a good pro. But I think because he's going to have a good combine, he's tall, he could throw 80 yards on his knee, it would be a very Browns pick. I think Cleveland needs to take Saquon Barkley at number one. I think, I think they have a lot of faith in Deshaun Kaiser. Hugh Jackson loves him, and I think he's going to be their future. He just needs to develop. Um, I would go Barkley. I know they're talking about keeping Isaiah Crowell, but I don't think he's the answer at running back. He's very inconsistent year after year, and injuries are a problem there as well. So I would go Barkley. He's definitely, like I said, the best player in the draft. This is a rare running back talent. We're not talking about you know, Leonard Fournette from last year or some of the other running backs, uh, Joe Mixon even for Cincinnati who didn't get too many touches. But for Saquon Barkley, I think his destination will be to Cleveland. And if they get him even at four, 
even a bigger surprise for them. I don't think he's going to drop the four, though. We'll see. So, keeping on with, you know, football players, what do you think about uh, a couple of days ago, Russell Wilson striking out during the Yankees' uh, spring game? He may have struck out, but I loved it. I think it's great for the sport to see somebody go cross-sport. I know he's a, you know, Super Bowl-winning quarterback. I know he's technically a superstar quarterback. They kind of put him in that echelon, but... Russell Wilson's a, a, obviously a, a great talent. He was drafted to baseball before he was drafted to football, so that was his first opportunity at going to pro sports. Um, but obviously his history, he loves the game of baseball, and for him to play with the Yankees, I mean, you're talking about a team who is going through this period right now where they're kind of turning over, turning over to their young players that were in their farm system, and he's getting to you know learn from them, learn from Aaron Boone, the new manager, and I think that was probably a dream come true for Russell to be part of that organization for a few days. I would love it. I would love to see it more. I mean, Jameis Winston played baseball in college. Like, there's a lot of people that probably even played in high school. I, you know, the injury thing always kind of comes to mind. But, you know, Russell Wilson, he guy's an athlete. I mean, I, he's probably a little more beaten up this year with the way Seattle protected him. But I have no problem with it. I mean, obviously, he's not going to go and he's not going to hit 300. But, you know, he gets a couple at-bats. He turns a double play or two. I think it's cool. I like it. So, keeping on with baseball and the Yankees, you know, the Yankees have lost <laughs> – Two games out of their last 11, you know, including a 7-2 to win earlier today against the Tigers. Is this a preview of how dominant they plan on being in this upcoming season? I mean, I'm excited. I actually just got tickets for opening day because this is going to be a really exciting opening day for John Carlos Stanton now with the Yankees and Aaron Judge and Gary Sanchez. And you can just reel off the roster because this team is very unique. They have a lot of great pieces. I think this is uh, a kind of a precursor to what things are going to come to. I think the Yankees are going to win the division this year. How many I, games do you think the Yankees are going to win, Cody? I predicted 101 games. Shame. <laughs> Shame on Get you. Get out of here. Shame on you. 101 wins. It's not going to happen. It is going to happen. No, They're going to score no, runs. They don't even need good no. pitching, and that rotation is That's good enough good. as it is it's to win the fish. AL East. Put the fish away. <laughs> That's for a different show. But point being is that obviously the Yankees didn't spend time in trying to find another pitcher because they have strong faith in their pitchers right now. Jordan Montgomery is going to round out the five in that rotation. He had a solid rookie year for a guy who really wasn't supposed to be in the major leagues last year. And, again, a lot of power on this team. The home runs speak for itself. And talk about a hitter's park. They could honestly win a bunch of home games, a good percentage. I'd say maybe even 80% of their home games, to be completely honest, just by scoring runs. He is such a Yankee homer, it sickens me. They're going to win 93 games That's got, this year. got two Giants homers over there. I'm, I'm a Yankees fan, too. No, no. So you know. it, it's fine ah. to be a Yankees fan. You just don't have to be a homer like him. They're going to win 93 games this year. They're going to lose in the LCS again this year. It's just, I, you know, I just call it as I see it. Now... I understand they do have um, all their power hitters. I just can't wait till the base are loaded in the playoffs and then Judge, Stanton, and Sanchez all strike out in a row because that, if they're not if they're not hitting a home run, that's what they're doing. Not they happening. strike out way too much. I understand CC is going to be fine this year. Severino's an ace, no doubt about it. Montgomery's going to be fine out of the bullpen. I understand all the pieces are there, but in terms of staying healthy. I don't know if they're going to do it. I think strikeouts are going to hurt them. They're going to go through a stretch, and I'm okay with saying this. They're going to go through a stretch. They're going to win like 30 games and lose 10. But then they're going to go on another stretch where they go like 20 and like 35 or something. They're going to be too hot and cold, I think, to win 101 games. Name of the game, score and runs, and they're going to do a bunch of that. They have a lot of great pieces in that lineup that can get RBIs. Didi Gregorius was that guy coming down the stretch last season for them. They have a couple holes they need to figure out what to do if they're going to go with their younger players like maybe Glaber Torres or if they're going to go with Brandon Drewy at second base who they just traded for. So they have a couple decisions still to make, but I think the premise for a stacked lineup, probably one through six, is currently in place for the Yankees. I just think 101 is a little absurd. <clears throat> With how dominant the Astros were last year, that's all they got was 101. So to say they're going to do that, I don't know. Well, as is all the time we have for this Rowan Roundtable, after the break, Cody and Derek will have more Rowan Sports News. Come right back. Welcome back. Time to dive into the latest on the diving teams. Derek? Thanks, Cody. Sean Piacente and Chad Shire competed at the NCAA Regional on Friday and Saturday for the men's diving team. Piacente earned third place on the three-meter diving board, totaling 526 points over 11 dives. 
Shire would finish 12th with a total of 420 points. Piacente's best dive of the day earned him just over 61 points, while Shire's best earned him just over 51 points. The two found themselves in a good place heading into the second day of competition. On day two of the NCAA Regional, Sean Piacenti and Chad Shire continue to move their way up the rankings. Piacenti finished sixth place on the one-meter board with an impressive 439 points on 11 dives. He also qualified for the national championships during the performance. Chad Shire would only finish in 16th on the one-meter board with 397 points. This was lower than his 12th place finish on the three-meter board on Friday. Claudia Zokowitz and Corinne Finkbinder of the women's diving team competed at the NCAA Regional this past weekend. On day one, both competitors took on the one-meter dive. Zokowitz ended the day in 22nd place with 344.75 points. Her best score came on her seventh dive with a one-and-a-half somersault pike, accumulating 37.95 points. Finkbinder rounded out the top 25 with 318.7 points. She saved her best dive for last with a back one and a half somersault half twist free, scoring 37.8 points. The two divers moved on to day two, looking to conquer the three meter board. Corinne Fink Finkbinder moved up three spots to finish in 22nd place with a total of 338.75 points. Her best dive came in the seventh round with a back two and a half somersault tuck, which was awarded 40.6 points. Zokowicz finished in 23rd with 335.05 points. In round five, she scored 37 points with a back one and a half somersault, half twist free, which was her best dive. This was the first appearance for both divers at the regional stage. After the break, Ayla Gideon interviews two men's track and field runners in this week's Prof Spotlight. Stay tuned. Welcome back to All Access. Time for this week's Prof Spotlight. Joining me are Kelvin Veltri and Francis Terry of the men's track and field team. Thank you for being here. Our pleasure. Thank so you. I was recently informed you guys are ranked first nationally. Mm -hmm. Great job. Um, tell me about what contributed to the team's success. So we had a lot of great performances throughout the year. You know, Bobby's had some really fast hurdles, but this past, <laughs> this past weekend he just, uh, I think he stuck a number one spot on the rankings, which helped out a lot. Um, the DMR just qualified. Um, I think we're at, what, number five or six or mm -hmm. something. And then a couple weeks ago, I had a fast run at, at Boston, which, which helped out a lot too. Mm -hmm. But pretty much just a bunch of things throughout the year. And then especially these past couple weekends, yeah. we had some high marks, which really set us up in a good position. Yeah, it definitely boosted you guys up. Mm -hmm. um, so this past weekend, you guys traveled to Ithaca College. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about um, your exp expectations for that meet. Uh, we were just going up there to have some fun, just perform. We know what we were capable of. So, like I said, Bobby said he, um, Bobby set a number one mark, and uh, yeah, we just had some other good marks, and it was pretty much just a, a tune-up for, for this weekend coming up. But uh, yeah, we just went and had some fun. So you guys <laughs> utilize it. You know, we are we already know we're going over to NJX. Um, like Miles has used this. You know, you know, test out what we got. You know, get mm -hmm. used to the course and whatnot. Well, you guys have been used to the course, mm -hmm. but use it to you know work on things if yeah. you had it worked on practice already. Great right. stuff. Um, tell me about the other seven entries going along with you to uh, Alabama this weekend. So we have Bobby Cooks in the 60 hurdles. Um, Sean Mumford, he actually just qualified um, at the Ithaca meet. That um, so that was mm -hmm. huge for us. Uh, the 400, I'm running the four. We have the DMR, which we just broke the school record. And then we have our four by four um, of Chris Messiano, Justin Bishop, Jamil, and me. So we have five going down. and. We're going to do an alternate so we're all healthy just to make sure. Yeah. And that's about it. And then we have Harrison and Jeffrey in the jumps. And Jeffrey actually just qualified at Ithaca too, so that was huge for us. Mm -hmm. Harry's at the number one spot right now, so I think. Yeah. Definitely going to spread some great things. But what are, your, what are your expectations for that meet? Like, what can we expect another PR? For nationals? Yes. Well, the way that nationals usually goes, I don't, I don't really know how it goes for, for the shorter distance, but for longer distance, right. I don't know if we can expect PRs really because it's normally just a tactical race kind of like you go out slow mm -hmm. like really slow <laughs> and then you just try and sprint it in like the last yeah, couple laps mm -hmm. but I think yeah I mean we're on pretty good spots right now so if we just go and compete a lot of us have been there before and um, going in in first place there's gonna be a lot of teams gunning for us but I think if we just go in and do what we've been doing uh, we have a good shot to get that title yeah 
So, um, are you aware of any serious competitors? Is there any uh, colleges that you know definitely trying to head out to Rowan? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, lacrosse, definitely. They're the defending indoor and outdoor champs, mm. I think. Um, Christopher Newport's had some a lot of really good times. Uh, MIT is up there. Uh, Mount Union. Um, a lot of really competitive individual guys that are defending national champions are coming back too. So mm. they're, they're, they're going to be looking to get some more range. <laughs> it was like Rowan came out of nowhere. What are they? <laughs> What's happening? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think uh, Rowan's going to uh, hold up against them? Obviously, you want the best, but an insight. I mean, I think we have a really just great group of guys going, and yeah, I think sure. that if we all just relax and the older guys like me and um, you know Harry and Jeffrey just take charge, we can um, just go and do do what we've been doing. Right. Yeah, hopefully, no many people will freak out, and you know, <laughs> we can just go and have a good time. Mm. So you guys are literally running the school, you know, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk it. about the records that's been broken, especially for you. Mm -hmm. You are a freshman. Mm -hmm. Great stuff you see. Thank you. Uh, tell me about that. Um, just the training. Um, Coach Dimmitt and Coach Tate have been really like on us. And uh, the training is just like making me better overall, especially with my teammates, Chris, Justin, mm -hmm. and uh, Hunter. Um, they've just been really helping me, pushing me. And um, the experience they have, just going into meets, like my first meet, I was very nervous coming in, and they just they showed like calm me down for every meet, and it's just like a great team experience so far. Well, I'm so glad you start literally started off running like great <laughs> start to your career. I bet we're seeing other great stuff um, for next season as well. Um, Kevin, you not only had success in uh, what you're doing right now, but also in cross country. <laughs> Tell me about that. Oh, it's just been it's been an amazing ride. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really expect to go out and find this much success, but I put in a good work of, or a good summer of training, mm -hmm. and the results just started showing immediately. I just started winning right. race after race, and um, at that point, I mean, when you're, when you've been doing all that, there's not really much to be worried about when you get to the national right. level. Only just more jumping and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, right. For cross country, so, uh, how does that benefit you for indoor? So it was good. I, coming off of the cross country season, I was, you know, I had a nice high of getting that all American, and it really just yep. propelled me into win yeah i just had a good winter of training good. did all the stuff i was supposed to and mm -hmm. i was just hungry to get even more so this, that's why this winter season has been by far the best winter season yet too yeah. and it's, i'm just riding the train just riding the train like you know yeah, i had all the success and then you just like feeding off good great energy right. and yeah, like it's, from it's the a domino season. effect yeah yeah seriously um will be a, a <clears throat> perfect career end for you like What's a time you have in mind? Like, oh, if I steal this time at okay. um, um, Alabama, this would be like ideal. For Alabama, yes. Obviously, we we want to win the DMR. That's it. Um, mm -hmm. And in the DMR, I actually think we can get it. We can break the record again because it's going to be banked. <laughs> I see stuff. you like that. He was like, yeah. oh. <laughs> but I'm actually not going to be in it. But mm -hmm. yeah, especially you want your team to do yeah, well. I yeah, I want my team to do well. Yeah. Get all American. Yeah. Maybe maybe a ring. Maybe a ring. <laughs> First place. Right. And then for this 3K. Um, I think I still have the fastest true unconverted time, so mm. um, obviously I want to try and win that too, and then yeah. hopefully that'll be enough to contribute to a team title. So that'd be a pretty that'd be a pretty perfect ending to, to winter at least. Okay, so um, what does your coach think of all this as well? Like, how's he feeling? I know Coach Tim is like on a high right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's really really happy about it, but at the same time, it's I mean it's what he's been planning for, so it's it's kind of expected at this point. Mm -hmm. um, not like you know, not trying to sound cocky or anything, but yeah. like it's it's what the training is is meant for, and he ex and he knows what kind of races we're capable of running, you know how high we're able to jump and throw and everything like that. So it's really just feels like routine, you know. Right. I mean, he does a good job at, at keeping our heads level that way, too. Well, good luck this week. We're all very excited for y'all. We're rooting for every single one of y'all. I expect great things. Thank you. This, that thank is you. all the time we have. I'd like to thank Kevin and Francis for coming. Cody and Derek, back to you at the desk. Thanks, Isla. The baseball season is in full swing, so let's get you the latest on the props from the Diamond. Cody? Thanks, Derek. The Rowan baseball team kicked off their season at home against Stevens Institute of Technology. This was the first time the props have started the season at home since 1997. Home field proved to be the ultimate advantage for Rowan as they edged out a 3-2 victory. Center fielder Dan Shane led the way offensively as he went 3-for-4 with three runs scored and four stolen bases. Designated hitter Monty Strickland drove in two of the three runs for Rowan. 
On the mound, lefty Drew Ryback notched the win in relief. He pitched two innings, striking out a batter while allowing no hits. The baseball team played a doubleheader against Randolph Macon College on Sunday. After trailing two to nothing after three innings, the Pross would get on the board in the fourth after an RBI ground out from Kyle Gala. The team would explode later on for four runs in the seventh inning, as well as a final run to seal the deal in the ninth. The Pross took the first game six to two with help from Kyle Gala's two RBIs and Dan Shane's three hits. Drew Ryback earned the win for Rowan after throwing for three and a third scoreless innings late in the contest with four strikeouts. In the second game against Randolph-Macon College, the team continued being on a roll. The Pross would strike in the first inning with three runs, courtesy of an RBI single from Alex Kokos and a two RBI single from Monty Strickland. The score would change to a 4-1 to one Prof's lead after the second inning, putting a pause on scoring before another three Rowan runs in the fifth. The Prost would win the game 9-2, improving to a 3-0 record on the young season. Left fielder Monty Strickland finished with three hits and three RBIs for Rowan. The team's next matchup is on Tuesday against Arcadia University. We are through five segments, and that is the end of our show for this week. For Mo Ware, Ayala Gideon, Chris Devine, Cody Decker, and the entire All Access team, I'm Derek Hill. Enjoy your spring break, Profs.